As a full stack open source developer, digital nomad, YouTuber, how do I spend my money on the stuff that I need to do? Many people ask me about what I need to do to be able to get into this area and you know what they need to learn, who they need to speak to, who they need to network with. But also we don't talk about how much it costs because there are some fees that you need to spend. I recently wrote a blog post about the equipment that I have on my desk at home in the UK to be able to create videos and live streams link in the description below. And I look forward to writing one when I travel abroad in the next couple of days on how it works with a pared down version of my kit because I can't take my whole studio. However, equipment is only the tip of the iceberg of the investment that is needed and contribute to make. There are so many other things behind the scenes that are needed. In this video, I've broken it down into many hats that I have to wear as a YouTuber, community founder, UK freelancer, web developer, and I briefly touched on the digital nomad side too. So let's start off with, well, we're on YouTube, so let's start off with the YouTube expenses. So I started my YouTube channel approximately two and a half, three years ago. And instead of recording videos and doing live streams, say on my phone or on my webcam, I decided to buy lots of professional equipment. And I wish I hadn't, I wish I started before. Not only do I want to make sure that my audience had the best possible experience, but investing the money into my equipment from the outset I meant it forced me to show up and to use the equipment. I hate wasting money. And so it forced me to get started and I needed that push, but hopefully you don't. And any questions I can answer and help with, let me know, I really want to help. Over the years, I've spent many thousands of dollars building up my kit, maybe on kit that I didn't really need, but I thought I did to up my production game, uh, encourage me to create more content. Now I just love doing it. So really, I'm actually reducing my kit. I've probably got rid of 60% of my kit. It restricts me from being portable, but also makes it more difficult to get set up and just get started. And where it's really nice to just hit record and just record something or just go live and forget about dedicated streaming PCs and all this fancy stuff. Yes, you had more flexibility, but it was just more set up and more to go wrong. I'm not saying that to be a YouTuber, you'd have all this fancy equipment, far from it. There are so many content creators out there that built their equipment over time. And that's what I recommend you doing as well. As I prepare to travel abroad with one suitcase, it's quite a big suitcase, but when you put my kit next to it, it looks rather small. I'm also looking at other ways that I can reduce my kit to even do shorter trips, potentially come and visit you in your country. We could do a vlog and collab, and then I can go to another location. For example, for streaming, I use a platform StreamYard. And it means that I have to carry my dedicated streaming PC around with me. And to build this custom PC, I spent like $4,000 and another $1,000 on professional software equipment like vMix. But even though StreamYard is not as flexible as my professional rig, but being in the cloud and a popular choice for someone like me, it means all I need is a good connection and my computer and ideally a good mic and good camera and I can get started without having that big setup. I started editing my own videos and I started off with Final Cut Pro. To a lie, I started off with iMovies, very quickly went to Final Cut Pro, the professional version of iMovie, but then also moved to Adobe Premiere Pro for a video like this. And then as I wanted to create more and more videos and as I got busier with the community and client work, I also got myself a professional video editor who is editing this video right now. So Alona, thank you so much. A video and live streams need thumbnails. And for putting these together, I use Adobe Illustrator, as well as Lightroom and Photoshop to edit the photos. This is why I gained the whole Adobe suite for me was a good investment at $50 a month. It allowed me to have the entire suite because I needed more than two. If I remember correctly, if you had more than two or three apps from there, it's worth getting the whole suite. So I ended up getting the whole suite because I really enjoy Lightroom editing my photos, uh, Adobe Premiere. I don't edit so much anymore. Like I said, I've got an amazing video editor who does a much better job than me, a hundred times better and much, much faster. So I do enjoy it, but I don't have the time anymore. and I, I don't do as good job as a loner. <laughs> Photoshop I do uh, use an Illustrator again for editing uh, thumbnails and some other things I like to do where I can get templates from a place called Envato, but we'll come to that shortly in a minute. Just a, another quick note on the videos. I, I did find it very time consuming as much as I enjoyed it and my editing wasn't very professional. And I wanted to make sure the content I put out went out quickly. 
it didn't go out two months after I created the video because that's kind of how long it took me to edit the videos and fit it in between the work I did. So I wanted to make sure it was as professional as possible and it went out as quick as possible as I created the video to keep that momentum going and I could then share it on socials. So I sourced a video editor on the platform Upwork, which is a great place to find professional services. I was lucky to have found an amazing video editor, Alona, who I mentioned before, to help me do that. And that on average cost me about $500 per month. I also signed up to Google Drive Premium, which gives me two terabytes of storage for $100 a year. And this allows me to share my raw videos with my video editor, allows me to share the videos that to get edited with my clients. And I need that space. Probably two terabytes is probably overkill. But when I go to an event for an entire weekend, my poor video editor, Alona, gets kind of one to two terabytes of data just for that event at the weekend that might have had four or five cameras recording, taking photos, doing all sorts of things. So having that buffer of two terabytes is really useful. And in the grand scheme of things, $100 a year is not as much as some of the other things that I have to pay for. More recently, I signed up to Descript. It costs about $24 a month. And this is a platform where you can transcribe, edit, and mix your uh, audio and video and overlays in a kind of a basic form. It's kind of like a basic version of Adobe Premiere, but it does the transcription version, which is really nice. So if I have a really long live stream and I want Sarah to be ruthless in cutting things out uh, to make it really short and concise for a video. She likes reading the text version. So we get it transcribed on Descript, which is pretty, pretty good. And then Sarah can just cut out the text and automatically cuts out the video. And then what we do is we send that cut down version of the video to our video editor, Alona, where it can be made much more professional because the edits are quite sharp and might not be perfect. Actually, definitely aren't perfect. And Alona can improve those and make it a lot smoother and just more more visually pleasing for you all to watch and listen to. But what I do like about Descript is I like editing short audio or video clips for socials so I can have subtitles on it or captions so people can read it if they have it on mute on say Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or wherever it is. If they've got it on mute, they can still understand what is going on. And also closed captions make it more accessible for people too. And it does help Sarah actually get the skeleton of a live stream or a video into a blog post. It gives us some text to get started and then she can make it much more readable. It's more of telling a story rather than speaking. Because when we write, we it's very the text is very different to the way we speak. Okay, so community founder. So what are the costs that go around this? So Eddie Hub might have started primarily on Discord and GitHub. But in the last year, I've been keen to grow this so I can produce content and more projects to help community members in so many other ways. I'm really enjoying your feedback and ideas and support in that area. So Eddie Hub has a website and a monthly newsletter, and this was important to have the content that I produce on a single platform and easily managed by me, but also my Eddie Hub team. This is why I chose the all-inclusive platform Kartra. I mean, it provides so many different features. They're not perfect, but they're all in one place and it's really useful. They have multiple tiers. I did start out at $100 per month, but as our community grows, we've had to go on to the silver package because we've got more subscribers for our newsletter which is a great thing to have. And we, it's, we've gone to $200 per month. It allows me to create more courses and now I'm not limited to two or three courses. I can create unlimited courses on that $200 a month package, which is quite a lot of money, but I really want to get lots of courses out for you and lots of affiliate links so you all can make money from the courses as well. There's so many ideas around this. Uh, let me know your thoughts in the description below and we can chat more about it later. When creating Eddie Hub content, we want to make this more engaging and visually pleasing as much as possible. So I use Envato, which is $200 a year to find assets from photos to pictures to templates to music to sound effects, all sorts of things. I highly recommend it. It's really, really useful. Licensed music on YouTube is really important. So you don't get penalized for any music that isn't licensed. Eventually, I'd like to have my own online merchandise store for Eddie Howe. I know a lot of you are requesting this and I've done some research on this. While this does seem relatively straightforward to set up at this time, the cost of producing the items is not so expensive, but the postage and packaging is really way too high. I'd love to do the swag store at like kind of no extra, what's the word, 
profit to me, I'd love to give it to you at cost, at what it costs the platform to make it. But however, the posters and packaging is just way too high. So that's something we're holding off at the moment. You don't want to buy a t-shirt for $10 and have to pay $10 postage and packaging. But in the meantime, for the Eddie Hub swag, such as Hubba stickers, which cost about $100 for 300 stickers, that's what I pay. And then I have to cover the postage and packaging myself. For the t-shirt and hoodie that Sarah and me have, we got that from t-shirt studio store, which came to about $45. Again, the postage and packaging gets more cost effective as you do a bigger order, but most people will just order one item. So we do need to look at how we can make that more cost effective for all of you. Maybe with our ambassadors program, we can do something uh, along the lines where we have ambassadors in different countries or continents, and they can get a bulk order and they can then ship it to people that are local to them and we can cover those costs. We'll have some thoughts around that. And then again, we don't wanna make the admin time and overhead really, really high. But I really enjoy sending out the Eddie Hub stickers to you. Um, they're not too expensive and postage and packaging is around about $5 just for an envelope of five stickers. So it does add up over time. To host Eddie Hub domain and email, I use Ionos. Uh, which comes to, I think, about $100 per year. Uh, to host the Eddiehub projects such as Eddiebot, Linkfree, and we've got the event calendar coming out at the moment, I use DigitalOcean's managed Kubernetes service at a cost of about $20 per month, which is enough for now and for lots of future growth. It's really great. You've got a load balancer in front, Kubernetes cluster behind. I am going to have to attach some storage to that so that we can have persistent data on a Kubernetes cluster when we want to host databases on there where the Kubernetes cluster will manage the database. However, the storage of the data will be off to attached storage device. That will probably add an extra $10 per month. I haven't touched on dev expenses. Yes, there's laptops and those sorts of things, but I want to talk about more regular costs that I have to spend. So I spend about $80 a year on, on a GitHub Pro account. I can get this free as being part of the GitHub Star program, but I spend such a other large amount on GitHub. This seems quite small in the grand scheme of things. I do want those extra pro features. And the reason why I say I've got extra costs on GitHub is not because of usage. All my projects are open source. I get those for free on GitHub. I've never gone anywhere near the allowance they're very generous, but I do sponsor a lot of people on GitHub. So I spend between $500 and $1,000 a year on sponsoring you awesome people on GitHub. So if you haven't signed up for GitHub sponsors yet, make sure you do so we can sponsor you on there. I invest in Google's G Suite, which is about $60 a year. It gives me access to the pro features on Google, things like Gmail and Google Meet, and those things are really important. These are not essential expenses if you're in dev, but for me, they really help me work more efficiently. To make sure my work is safe and always available and backed up, I use Backblaze, which is about $70 per year to back up all my data. That's laptop, external RAID arrays, all those sorts of things. And at the moment, it's sitting around 16 terabytes. And soon as I go to Bali for six months, it's probably going to go up to 20 or so terabytes. So it's really great that I've got a fixed price for unlimited data. And additionally, if there's any issues with my computer, Backblaze can send me physical hard drive with all my data on it within 24 hours. I can download it, but to download that data is enormous. Another service that I use that I find really important is private internet access. They're a VPN service and I can use them on any hotspot that I connect to and they protect me. They protect my data to make sure no one's listening in to the traffic and everything we do is online. So this is really important. It only costs about $40 a year and that's up to about, I think, six devices. Although I've just bought another device called a Burl and it's like a Wi-Fi hotspot and you put your VPN onto that Wi-Fi hotspot. So when you go to a new and a co-working space or hotel, you connect your hotspot to the Wi-Fi. All your devices connect via that one hotspot. So therefore you don't have to add the Wi-Fi to all your devices, make sure they're all on VPN. You're all secure by a VPN already by this one device. So that was, I think, about $100 to buy. This area is specific to UK freelancing, but I do want to be transparent with this. So when working with my clients, if they're in the UK or US or Germany or anywhere in the world, I need to make sure that I'm following the UK laws in respect of invoicing and taxes and insurance and so forth. So I set up my own company in 2010. It's an LTD, a limited company, which was a one-off cost. And then I employed a firm of accountants to help me navigate the complicated world of filing all the different types of tax returns, company expenses, personal tax, all those sorts of things. And I could absolutely not do without this. I mean, it would just take too much time and I'd make 101 mistakes. That cost me $200 per month and it's definitely worth it. 
One thing I hate doing though is going through all my receipts and documenting my expenses so they can do all my taxes and so forth. But I need to do that and that's something I'm getting a bit better at or Sarah's helping me where I do it as they come up rather than wait three months, the accountant needs it and I need to work back through three months. Definitely little and often helps with that. I do also take out insurance for my business and my equipment. So if the equipment gets stolen or if I need professional indemnity, so that's if a client makes a claim against me, they're not happy with my work, or public liability, which means if someone gets injured on their property or my or the property is damaged due to my work or my equipment, and if my laptop catches fire or something and burns the building down. This is quite expensive, it comes to about $800 a year. In in 12 years, since 2010, I've never needed to use this, which is great, but it's there just in case it's ever needed. I think this is the one you're most interested in is Digital Nomad. I've been working remotely for six, seven years now, and while I always promote rest is super important, in reality, I do work during the holidays because I love what I do. I really just always like to geek out with all you awesome people. And this happens when you're passionate about what you do and it's not a job. I mean, to be honest, since 2010, I've never worked a day in my life. That doesn't mean I don't work hard, but I've never actually worked a day because I don't call it work. Yes, to my parents and family, I say it's work because they wouldn't understand why I'm not working and doing a hobby. But all of you understand. So mostly through the holidays, uh, either take one or two weeks, and that was because Sarah was in a full-time job, working nine to five with the four weeks holiday. But during that time, I would reduce my client work to make sure that we could have some downtime and relax and so forth. But as we both now embark on the remote digital nomad lifestyle, for those of you who don't know, Sarah has joined me full-time on EddieHub, which is awesome. We might stay now longer in other countries. Actually, we're gonna go spend uh, a week in Dubai and six months in Bali. So any of you are out there, give us a shout. I'd love to geek out with you. I have to look into the rules and regulations um, of those countries to make sure I can legally work there any tax issues, insurances, those sorts of things. We're spending three months in Portugal just now over the summer, it was relatively straightforward. There was no visa or work permit required. I could drive from London to Porto and just fill my car with all my equipment. I could take extra just in case uh, I forgot something or I might need it. I just took loads of extra stuff. But because of the equipment I wanted to take and lots of extra stuff, I did have to get a carne. It's spelled carnet. I don't know they pronounce it carne, which is like a passport for my tech items to prove that I'm using it for work and I'm not gonna go resell it in another country. And I'm gonna come back with them. It's like a passport, You when you leave the country, when I leave UK, I get it stamped. When I enter the next country, I get it stamped. They check all the equipment I have. I had something like, I don't know, 150 items. You need to get your camera, for example, then you've got the lens, then you've got the memory cards, then you've got the batteries, then you've got the cables, you've got the chargers. So 200 items or 100 items sounds like a lot, but one item could be made up of like 10 or 15 items itself. And the cost of the carnet is based on the value of the items. So it cost me about $1,000 to get the carnet for all my equipment. So when traveling aboard as digital nomad, you need to factor in the cost of getting a business visa as well, or a carnet as well for your equipment, depending on the country, flights and accommodation and data day expenses. I hope this gives you an idea of a real life version of what it's like to be me or to be a digital nomad. I do like to share the laptop pictures on the beach. I do like to share great co-working spaces, lots more to come. But I do also want to show you that it is fun. I love doing it. I wouldn't change it for the world. And if you want to do it, ask me questions. I'm an open book. I'd love to help out as much as I can but there are hidden expenses that you might not realize at the time. I mean, to give an example today, we can't change one of our flights because the quarantine uh, duration has changed. So we have to change one of our flights. We can't get a hold of the airline um, from Jakarta to Bali. The menu system is not in English, so it's hard to navigate through that. We're on hold for two hours and that hold in two hours costs us more than the flight itself. So in the end, we're just booking another flight, hopefully having two flights to the same destination one day apart isn't a problem. But I just see Sarah messaging me now and she's telling me that they were able to change the flights via email. So now we have two flights on the same day on the same flight. So we have four tickets. So we now need to go try and cancel that because that's gonna look a bit weird and probably a bit dodgy. And you know, I look dodgy already, so I don't wanna get flagged up for any more, any more reasons to get flagged up, let's say. Yeah, I need to go and try and sort that out. Got a couple of weeks before we get to Jakarta. Um, we're heading to Dubai first, it should be okay. But there's lots of admin tasks like that, confusions, language barriers that do also take time. Sometimes it can be fun. Today we're heading for PCR test so we can fly to Dubai tomorrow. So let's see how it goes. Fingers crossed, 
It's the first PCR test I'm not doing myself, like to myself. So hopefully they don't go to town on going up my nose and in my mouth. We'll see, wish me luck. I will try and vlog a bit behind the scenes so you can see what it's like. I know Sarah and me have started a second YouTube channel and Instagram account called Eddie and Sarah Explore, where we do want to share more the digital nomad side, uh, travel side and so forth. So do check that out, have a look, see what you think of it. And hopefully um, when we get feedback from you on that channel as well, we can see what sort of content you want to see and we'll also help you to get into this lifestyle if that's something that you want. If you've made it till the end, thank you so much. I really appreciate you sticking around. I hope this video was useful. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe below if you haven't already and hit the bell button to get notified every time I post a video and go live and join our Discord so we can chat between live streams with the amazing Eddie Hub community. It's a super awesome, inclusive, supportive, safe space for all of us to geek out. Obviously I'm biased, but it's true. Trust me, all the members there are amazing and uh, I really thank you all for joining me there. I know this might all sound really scary to become a freelancer or a digital nomad, but I don't want to scare you. I just want to make it realistic. And I wouldn't change this for the world. Like I said before, I have the flexibility to choose my clients, to choose my projects, to choose my technologies, to choose when I work, how hard I work. This month I might want to do less work because we're going to an exciting new country and I want to just work a little bit. Or I'm staying at home for this month for whatever reason and I want to do more work. Having that flexibility is really amazing when you work who you work with is just awesome and these expenses are just part of that life that you choose but your income is always going to be greater and you don't have to pick all these tools you can choose the ones that you need there are usually free alternatives um, make some suggestions in the comments below. For example, instead of Photoshop, you could use Canva, which is an online free tool. Instead of Premiere, you could use iMovies free, Movie Maker is free. And there is a new popular one that I forget that everybody is using. I can't remember what it is. I can't remember. I'll put it in the description below. But there is a popular video editing tool that a lot of people are using. DaVinci Resolve, I remembered it. Yes, so DaVinci Resolve has got a free and a premium version, but I know a lot of people are using the free version and it has loads of amazing features. But to everything that there is, you know, good and great, like even traveling, like if you want to travel just on a holiday, you've got the hassles of booking the flights, the hotels and the flying and traveling and taxis and whatever itself, going through security and all those sorts of things. So every good thing there is a little bit of downside nothing's 100 perfect but i do recommend getting into freelancing you become your own boss and then when you do it remotely you can work from anywhere in the world if you want to be on the beach you want to be skiing you want to be up a mountain you could do whatever you want 